I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled tonight to welcome two old friends, Hu Yifan and Fang Yiping. Uh, normally, they would have come to the United States in January. They would have gone to the economics, what is it called, the Economics Association meeting, and then they would have come to New York. We were, would have held a day or two days of track two economic dialogues. Um, then we would have done a program generally hosted at Citibank where Drs. Fang and Hu would talk and their colleagues from Peking University and throughout China would talk. We would have a full four hour program and have an outlook on China's economy. Obviously with COVID and the difficulty of traveling um, between the United States and China, we have postponed this to early March and we are doing it on Zoom. The good news is we can have many, many, many more people participate. So happy to have all of you. I think you have got uh, Dr. Hu's biography. She is currently the regional chief investment officer and chief China economist at UBS Wealth Management. She had a distinguished career before that, including being at the World Bank and a visiting scholar at the Peterson Institute. And she got her PhD in the United States, in her case, at Georgetown University after she had graduated from Jida, uh, Zhejiang University. Huang Yiping uh, is now the Jingguang Chair and Professor of Economics at the National School of Development at Peking University. He also had a very distinguished career. In fact, I first knew him when he was, I think, Chief Regional Economist at Citibank and has his PhD from ANU, Australian National University, and his undergraduate was done at Zhejiang, Zhejiang Agricultural University. So also a very distinguished career. So let me turn it over to Yiping first uh, to kind of talk about the macro environment. And then we'll go to Yifan to kind of have a sectoral analysis. Then we'll go to questions and answers. Yiping, thank you so much. Ifan, thank you so much for joining us. You are great supporters of constructive economic relations between the United States and China. So thanks. Thank you, uh, Steve. It's a uh, um, great honor to join you again um, for the discussion of um, the Chinese economy. I like to just uh, kick off um, by offering some uh, brief uh, uh, views on the outlook of the Chinese economy for 2022. Um, your audience probably are all well aware of the condition, the weak condition of the Chinese economy <clears throat> at the end of last year. In fact, the, the Central Economic Work Conference, which was held in early December last year, used the three phrases to characterize, characterize the um, economic condition. Number one, shrinking demand. Number two, supply shock. And uh, number three, weakening expectation, which basically means the economy was pretty weak. Um, even though we ended up with an annual GDP growth rate of 8.1%, but you look at the third quarter, the fourth quarter, growth continued to ex uh, decelerate and decelerated more than um, many people expected. Certainly, it was uh, far beyond what I had uh, anticipated early on. So now the government has decided to stabilize the economy. That will be the key policy uh, for 2022. Um, and we already start to see uh, policy actions um, already. When you look at the, the potential policy actions trying to um, support the growth, the first thing you look for is the macroeconomic policy. So um, I think if you look closely at what is happening in terms of uh, monetary and the fiscal policy, we are already seeing lots of actions. In terms of monetary policy, uh, PBOC, the central bank, is still described as um, a prudent monetary policy, but I would probably use a, a, a term that is closer to what is the current situation now, accommodative monetary policy. We already have seen um, cut to the, um, the reserve requirement ratio. We have seen cut to um, various kinds of interest rates. So monetary policy is easing and 
the big number we saw in uh, um, January was what we call the total social financing, which really is an aggregate measure of um, the financing conditions for um, the non-financial sector in the Chinese economy, which jumped quite significantly, um, suggesting that monetary policy is easing. The only question I think there is how much further easing should we expect? Um, given that the Federal Reserve Bank is expected to tighten monetary policy, including raising um, the interest rate aggressively, that might contain um, limit the scope of monetary policy easing by the PBOC. Although my own view is that uh, um, the Fed's policy should not be a hard constraint for PBOC's policy action because the economy is much broader um, in uh, China than in some other places. Plus, we have a current account surplus, which is around 2% of GDP. We still have 3.2 trillion US dollar equivalent foreign exchange reserves. Plus, we still have some kind of capital account control. So I think if PBOC is determined to ease monetary policy to support economic growth, they can do it um, over the coming year. Whether or not they'll do it, um, it's an, an, another issue. Um, my other guess about the monetary policy is that they probably won't continue to focus on easing financing conditions for the SMEs, the small, medium-sized enterprises, which are now the backbones of the Chinese economy. So how to provide more lending to the SMEs and hopefully also trying to reduce the funding costs for SMEs would be a top priority. On the other hand, the fiscal policy is also becoming much more proactive. Although if we look at the, um, the fiscal deficit, which is an official deficit, will still probably only be a bit over 3.2%, 3%, probably around 3.2%. But the government will also um, issue a number, a, a wider range of special specialized bond, meaning the money raised for specific um, investment projects. So I think the fiscal policy will also become um, expansionary. Um, these are the actions we are already um, seeing. In fact, if you look at what happened in January also, um, the, 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 the bond issuance was much bigger, but the fiscal deposit increased at a much, at a much a slower pace, which means the, the Ministry of Finance is spending more money much more quickly than before. So these are the, the macroeconomic economic policies we're already seeing in um, taking actions. The next question is, well, then what will happen to uh, growth? My own sense is that we're obviously seeing the economy signs that the economy is gradually turning the corner. The PMIs, you're already seeing are showing that both in manufacturing, in non-manufacturing, probably the activities pick up partly because of um, the macroeconomic policy. But the real question is what kind of growth should we expect? Now, this coming weekend, in fact, starting from probably tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, um, the, the National People's Congress annual session will start. Uh, at, at, at the meeting, we'll probably see more detailed policy plans. Plus, um, there might be a, a set of a new growth target for this year. And the people, I hear people debating between 5% or 5.5%. Um, I don't know what will be the final number. My own sense is that with the policy action, but it will still be a very tough job for our economy to achieve even like a 5% growth. And let's take a quick look at the three key components of the economy. Um, the Chinese economy recovered from the COVID-19 with a very strong rebound, but that was mainly driven by two things. Number one was export growth. And the number two, part of the investment activities, so infrastructure in spending, and particularly early on property investment were very strong. These were the key drivers. If you look at the other part of the economy, for instance, manufacturing investment, which was relatively sluggish, consumption was is, is particularly weak, even um, now. So going forward, the real question is, with macroeconomic policy stimulus, 
what will drive the Chinese growth? If you look at, at exports, I and mean, exports were particularly strong, but uh, my guess is that it will not be sustainable because part of the reason why our exports were strong was because we controlled the pandemic relatively better than some other countries. Therefore, we produced uh, for some on behalf of some other countries. So if COVID situation stabilizes, then that additional stimulus coming from export growth will probably gradually ease and disappear. The second part of the story is investment. And obviously with the government wanting to boost economic growth, infrastructure spending will probably be strong. The government would probably also focus on things like uh, green development, new infrastructure, um, and so on. So I think there is a hope that infrastructure will be driving economic growth. There is a big question about whether or not property uh, investment in the property sector can play a role in driving growth. Manufacturing investment is improving, but whether or not it can become much stronger, uh, it's a question mark. Finally, consumption. Consumption has been weak for a number of reasons. Number one, because we have been um, in this COVID situation for almost two years, and many households' income been seriously affected, particularly low-income households. Number two, our income distribution is not particularly equal. Therefore, it affects aggregate consumption demand. And then number three, our social security system is not really well developed. Therefore, when you face uncertainty, households do not have enough confidence in supporting, in spending money and supporting consumer spending. So put all these things together. I do see a, a, a strong case that the economy will turn around. But there is also a question that how strong the economy can become. And I suspect that it will be a little bit of struggle for our economy to achieve five or even five and a half percent this year. I'll stop here, Steve. That's a fabulously clear uh, explanation of what the macroeconomic situation. Can I just ask one non-economist question before going to sure. Eva? How does the Fed, the Fed, we expect the Fed to raise rates between four and six times in the course of the rest of, of 2022. How does that constrain Chinese monetary policy? You said it does, but just, I'm sure it does, but how does that Well, the Fed is the most important global central bank. So when the Fed eases its monetary policy, um, other countries around the world, especially the developing country, China included, would see capital inflows, uh, currency appreciation, and possibly even rise of asset price. Basically it means when the Fed is easing, liquidity becomes abundant globally. And so developing countries would see capital inflows, currency appreciation. When the Fed starts to tighten monetary policy, the reverse happens. So this is why many developing countries would probably see capital outflow, currency depreciation, and a possibly even decline of asset prices. For countries with, with a very weak macro and financial fundamentals, they might actually experience a financial crisis again. I don't think that's the case in China, but uh, um, everything, um, other things being equal, China mm -hmm. could also start to see pressure on capital outflow if the US interest rates start to rise and the PBOC has to lower the interest rate, the interest rate differential could mm -hmm. reverse and that would mm -hmm. add pressure on China. Mm -hmm. So the question is whether or not the widening, the, 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 the changing differences in the interest rate in the US and the China would lead, lead to more dramatic changes in terms of capital outflows, in terms of uh, pressure on cap, uh, currency um, depreciation and so on. So this is the reason why PBOC would become more cautious. But as I pointed out earlier on, China's macroeconomic fundamentals are probably much stronger than many other countries. You still have a relatively strong growth. Our current account is still in surplus. We have 3.2 trillion US dollars foreign exchange reserves, plus 
our capital account is still not wide open. And so there is some room for PBOC to manage cross-border capital flows if they want. All these would create room for PBOC to ease if they want. In the question period, we'll get to some questions about whether that current account surplus is sustainable given a variety of factors, but we'll right. Ifan first and then go back to that question. But Ifan, you'll take us through a sectoral analysis. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, so I think the, um, I just want to uh, focus on for several sectors, like uh, investors are very concerned. First is for the property market. So last year, because of like uh, two key developers default, so that's actually dragged the whole market down, especially in Hong Kong market. I think there's a, a, a like default rate actually rose to like a 20% comparing with uh, like a less than 2% like in the 2020. So that's actually pushed a lot of concern in the market. Uh, I think that the policy mild easing came out last November. So I think that now the market's wondering like whether this year will be better. So in our view, we think that for the property market, I think the government has uh, emphasized that say housing is for living, not for speculation for several years. I think this overall tone will continue. So I think the way say last year, the PBOC came out for the credit easing is mainly for uh, stabilizing the market, not for bailing out the developers. So for the market wise, I think uh, for the credit easing is mainly to uh, try to secure the completion of the construction works. So I think uh, once like how one building starts and also there's uh, some purchase, housing purchase from the like household. So like uh, they uh, actually uh, suggested that for the bank will continue to support the loans even for some, develop, uh, for some de defaulted uh, developers. So that makes sure the construction work can continue. So then that can uh, ensure for the households can, for the, uh, for the purchasers can get the housing and also for the banks can get the loan bank and also for the supply chain, especially for the upstream supplies can get some money and also try to uh, like for the migrant workers can get their wage like before the Chinese new year. So I think it's mainly to stabilize the market. So also uh, some investors ask, what if this housing cannot be sold out? So whether it will become something like uh, uh, also become some troublesome. So I think that's actually come out the policy. I think the government actually suggests like how uh, to um, uh, speed up the affordable housing project. I think that will be also emphasized in the MPC, the coming MPC as well. So that means like uh, uh, in the past 10 years and for the government, I think the focus is for the Shanty Town renovation. So for the coming five to 10 years, I think the affordable housing will become like a key subject. So I think the, for the local government could probably uh, acquire some uh, uh, like uh, the housing using for affordable housing. So that's another stabilization. For the developer side, we still expect this year for the default rate will be uh, pretty high. For the first quarter and the second quarter, there's a, each quarter, there's a, a 10 billion of the debt to pay. Uh, because for developers, they are not allowed to issue bonds in the mainland. So main bond, like our main issues is in the Hong Kong market. So we also expect this market will uh, gradually shrink down. So also for the medium and the long term, and we still expect like a more tightening policy will come out. Uh, I'm not saying more tightening. I think it's a, like a, a for the long term policy will come out. For example, property tax. I think Chinese government has been prepared for years and then now technically it's already, I think the things like a 2018, it's already ready to uh, start, but because of the uh, economic slowdown, so it's a uh, postponed. So I think that we expect this year, uh, it's not nationwide of the property tax, but definitely for some of the cities, like for example, Shenzhen, Hangzhou and Xiamen, I think it uh, could be the candidate. Uh, the property tax could be uh, collected like uh, maybe as early as this year or next year. So the overall tone, I think has stabilized the market, but there's uh, no plan for bailout. For developers, 
Uh, I think mainly like for the SOE developers, I think they're in a better situations because they can still issue bonds in the interbank market in China and also easier for them to get loans. For the private developers, I think the quality developers will survive. Uh, for this uh, highly leveraged developers have to either divest their assets uh, to uh, self bail out, but uh, there's uh, no policy to come out to build them out. Uh, the second, uh, I think the sector I wanted to discuss is for the tech sector. So last year, I think for the China tech, actually it's also um, ha have faced a huge pressure. Many of the uh, stocks actually dropped uh, over 50%. So that's mainly because of the regulatory uh, pressure. So in our view, uh, we think for the China, for the, on the tech sector, for the regulatory measures, actually it's in line with the global trend. Uh, however, the difference is, I think the global uh, regulatory measures, I think they have implemented it for the past 10 years, and it's always coming with, uh, uh, like uh, coming out with a review and discussion before implementation. So last year, I think the China for the policy is uh, came out like uh, within a year. And I think the, for this kind of very intensive policies and uh, indeed put pressures on the, on the sector. Uh, but uh, look at this year, we think the major measures or the law framework are already announced. I think that's actually is a, uh, should benefit like for the sector overall for the medium and long term. And also uh, this year is more like about implementation. So in our view, I think the pressure is uh, much relieved. And also for the valuation for this, this sector, actually now it's uh, pretty reasonable. It actually should be say, attractive comparing with uh, uh, it's uh, like a US peers. So uh, we expect this year and also for the corporate earnings this side, and we think it's still like uh, promising. So this year we could, we, we expect there's uh, like a rebound from this sector this year. Um, but there's also also some headwinds for this sector. This year it's not from China, probably it's from the US side. Uh, as you know, for the US last year in December, the US SEC announced for the Chinese, for the ADRs, uh, if cannot meet the auditing uh, requirement in the US has to be delisted uh, uh, within three years. So the grace period is three years. Uh, recently for the China competition bill passed by the senator shortened that timeline to two years. So that means as early as uh, 2023, uh, uh, some of the Chinese, uh, the ADS have to be delisted in uh, the US. So I think the, for the China side is already uh, get uh, try to get prepared, especially for the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, lower the requirement for the secondary listing in Hong Kong. Uh, starting from the January this year. So currently we see there's a 200, over 240 companies uh, listed in uh, the US, the Chinese company. Uh, we have seven, 17 companies uh, already moved, uh, secondary listed in Hong Kong. That's accounting actually already 69% of the, uh, the market cap. That's including Alibaba and uh, all this kind of Jingdong, all these kind of big companies. And also uh, after the lowering the requirement and another 52 qualified to move back, they also accounting 29% of the total market cap. So there's all, the, the rest, there's a large number over like a hundred, over 150, uh, but they only count for less than 3% of the market cap. Uh, we expect for this part of the companies and uh, the Chinese for the regulatory could uh, relax the policy to let them to disclose their like uh, for the auditing, uh, auditing like uh, to try to meet the auditing requirements in the US. So let's see. Uh, so overall speaking, we think there is still smooth transition, uh, but the only concern is for the valuation. Because for the US, for the daily, the trading volume is about like uh, two, uh, 200, uh, 200 million. Uh, no, it's uh, um, I think it's a 20, uh, 200, uh, 200 billion, uh, 20 billion, uh, I think it's a per day. 
uh, US dollar per day, but in Hong Kong, it's uh, like uh, probably uh, much less. It's about like a 20% 20, uh, 20 of the volume. So I think that's actually less than 20%. So that's actually uh, could give some pressure on the like uh, on, on, on the stock. So yeah, so that's the mainly, uh, I think the, the, the two sectors like how we concern. I just stop here. Are they preparing to delist or are they hoping that so there can be some negotiated settlement between the SEC and the Chinese authorities? The CSRC has talked about uh, being very willing to negotiate a settlement which allow the Chinese companies to remain listed in the United States, or they're basically saying this isn't going to happen. We're just going to move to Hong Kong. Mm, I think for the company wise, uh, I think for them, I think there's a dual listing definitely is the best choice for them. Uh, but the based on the China's data securities uh, law, I think the, uh, many of the e-commerce platforms have the sensitive data like uh, the consumer behavior and also financial data. So I think the, for this part of the companies, especially for the 17 largest uh, uh, companies already secondary listed in Hong Kong, I think the chance of the uh, dual listing is very small. Uh, the, uh, the, that said, I meant like uh, there's over 150 small companies and they only count less than 3% of the market cap. For those companies, I think they could have chance to stay in the US. Mm -hmm. Those that don't transfer, that don't need to reveal data wouldn't be something they could fall on, they could allow a proper audit in effect is what you're saying. Yes, yes. Uh, it's unfortunate, <laughs> but it's a sign of of um, of decoupling. Um, but 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 you know, even like uh, listening in Hong Kong, I think that for the U.S. investors still can invest, uh, yeah. but just like less convenient. <laughs> but won't it move volume to Hong Kong? That to the extent you cannot buy that stock at on the NYSE or Nasdaq. You will simply it will move most of that volume to uh, Hong Kong. Yeah, uh, I think part of the volumes could move to Hong Kong, uh, to, uh, but not all. But definitely, we will have the pressure on the valuation. But I also mentioned uh, I one thing I did mention that is that we have the stock uh, stock connect with the mainland. So in China, actually for the mainland market, the trading volume, uh, daily trading volume is also very high. That's about 50% of the US trading volume. So I think the, if they can be uh, included in the stock connect list, I think the, for them will be, uh, the pressure will be much relieved. But currently for the secondary listing uh, cannot be included in the connector yet, but we think that the policy could be relaxed in the future. Um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has created a human tragedy of enormous proportions. So I almost feel awkward asking a question about economic effect, but this is a program on the outlook for the economy. So I should ask it, what will be the economic effects of the war in Ukraine? What will be the effect of American sanctions or I should say EU, America, the Western world sanctions on Russia, on China's economy, and what, if anything, is China doing to prepare? Um, well, maybe I can say something brief and Yifan can tell you how to, uh, where to put your money. Um, the, the main connection between China and Russia is really the supply of energy and agricultural products. So, um, that is the main direct impact. My, my guess is that uh, um, the authorities probably want to continue with that uh, relation, if possible. Um, so there is a potential risk of whether that supply chain might be disrupted at some stage, especially when it's a link related to some financial channels and so on. But the direct impact, I think, will be limited. And obviously, the, uh, the conflict or the war itself would substantially increase the risk of premium 
Um, and I'm sure Yifan will comment on it, what the impact on financial uh, market. Um, the biggest question really is not about uh, um, disruption of supply of energy or agricultural products, but really the overall economic sanctions imposed by the US and the many of its allies. That is become so broad based. And uh, um, the big question is, well, um, should China comply with it or uh, uh, what, what, what will happen to, to China? My guess is on the one hand, the authorities probably want to maintain the normal, the usual economic relations, especially related to um, trade. But at the same time, I guess um, in relation to um, the financial sanctions and so on, um, I mean, if there are already channels established between the two countries for cross-border payment, they might be able to use that uh, channel. But overall, I think, uh, I mean, the sanctions, for instance, kicking um, some of the Russian banks out of the SWIFT system, I don't think the Chinese financial institutions would, will be able to, um, to do otherwise, because these are most of these Chinese banks also have global exposure. And if they do it, I'm sure there will be consequences. So, um, so just the summary of my, my, my take on the impact. Um, the overall, we don't know yet because this is still evolving, but the direct impact is on trade on certain products, but a more broader implication is on what happens um, in terms of the, the depths and the breadth of the sanctions in relation to the financial sector. One particular issue that really shocked me and I, I think also shocked some people in China is that uh, um, the decision to freeze um, the, the Russian central bank's foreign exchange reserves and uh, particularly now Switzerland um, is going to uh, uh, freeze um, the assets by, uh, uh, owned by Russians. These are the things normally in, this, in the past the, in our discussion of the China-US trade conflict, this is, was a one issue often raised by some experts. My position in the past was, well, that's not very unlikely because that would backfire on the US position in the international financial system. But this is happening today. So I, I mean, I think it's too early. It's too early to draw exact implications, but I'm sure people will think again about how to allocate your assets going forward, because you can't guarantee there will be no uh, a conflict between China and the, and, and the US. And this is why I think we all need officials and individuals included. We need to think more carefully about asset allocation in, in the future. Well, Ifan, you work for UBS. You <laughs> <laughs> you have a, a view on that and then generally on what the effect will be on China? Um, uh, let, let me talk about from the asset allocation uh, side. I think the uh, uh, Yiping just mentioned. So I think the, uh, so uh, because of the event, I think the also drove, drove the lots of the market volatility. Uh, so from the uh, assets like uh, allocation side, and we think uh, first, I think the, that will be actually drive the commodity prices continue to higher. Uh, so we currently already see the, for the oil price already over like $100 per barrel. And I think the, because of this uh, uh, tension, I think that it will like uh, stay high for a while. And also for like uh, both countries, I think the other, uh, Actually, the agriculture uh, uh, are the producers of the agriculture goods, especially for the corns and the weeds. And we expect that one will also bring some uh, volatility like, uh, uh, like uh, this year for the market. Uh, at the same time, and we also think for the, uh, for the gold prices, I think uh, currently, uh, like uh, it's uh, actually it's close to the two thousand pounds, like uh, for a while, but uh, now it's uh, like uh, it's kind of uh, like uh, normalized a little bit. But we think this year will still keep like a uh, pretty high, and also have the chance like uh, to keep like uh, uh, like uh, even overshoot like uh, two thousand dollars again. And also, I think uh, for this one, and as EP also mentioned that like uh, many things could happen. 
So for the asset allocation, diversify for the investment is very important, especially like how to diversify between the regions and the sectors and also assets like uh, classes. It's uh, important, like important for investors. Um, and also, I think it also flags the strength of the dollar because dollar normally is a safe haven um, currency. And plus, we expect a six to seven uh, Fed hikes, Fed rate hikes this year. So that will make dollar even stronger. But that will also probably put some pressure, like especially for the emerging countries, like uh, comparing with dollar. And finally, I think the, for the in terms of the asset allocation, I think that this year, because given the volatility, one side we still think there's a, some um, <clears throat> strong rebound, strong recovery of the economy. Uh, for so for the cyclical sector and also for the value sector, will benefit from this kind of economic recovery and also further hikes. But at the same time, we think the uh, to it's important to build up defensive uh, like portfolios. So this year we expect, for example, the healthcare, and I think it's a very defensive sectors, and also its valuation last year is uh, very low. And this year, hopefully, with the Omicron situation. Uh, gradually relieved. I think that this sector could be uh, bring some uh, defensive at the same time and also some uh, like a positive upside for investors. And also the hedge funds probably this year is also, uh, 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 I think it's a good way to pack your assets. And finally, I think the, um, like if we just uh, to uh, probably uh, to filter some uh, noise, like in the short term, I think for the long term, some of the like a uh, long, like a uh, trend, like uh, for the global, like a uh, decarbonization, I think is still the topic. So the green tech and also for this kind of renewable energies and the EV chain, I, I think is still the trend. And also for the tech sector, especially like uh, for the uh, middle cap uh, sectors, I think uh, still will be some, uh, 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 some uh, good choices for investors. What has this spike in oil prices cost China or what will it cost China on an annual basis uh, in current account surplus? Obviously, it's in, China is an energy importing country, Russia is an energy exporting country, country. I think the largest energy exporting country now in the world. Uh, what is the cost to China annually, and what will that do to the current account surplus for 2022, assuming that this spike is not temporary, that it's going to actually, and I think most U.S. analysts think that this spike is going to kind of remain in the $110, $120, $130 a barrel uh, price? Um, in my view, uh, yes, uh, the China actually imports like uh, uh, China's like uh, energy structure, like a uh, thirty percent uh, dependence on the oil. Six percent oil are imported, like um, uh, like uh, imported. So that will have some pressure on the for the China's like uh, uh, the overall like uh, the prices. But as you know, like uh, in China, first I think the the impact will be. Um, reflected on the PPI inflation. So for the producer price index, so that's uh, last year we already say it's a hiked. So it's a very similar to the global trend. We actually like overshoot like 10% uh, like uh, in the fourth quarter, but it's already gradually down or it's already dropped to like uh, below the uh, like a nine, uh, 10%. So I think this year, if the oil prices continue to uh, climb uh, or stay high for a while, that will continue to uh, pull up the PPI inflation. But for the CPI inflation side, we see it's quite interesting. Last year, 0.9%. This year, we see we expect that for the CPI inflation still keep mild at 2%. So last year, the PPI is a pretty high, and but the transmission channel in China from PPI to CPI is a very limited. Uh, because first, I think that for the CPI is uh, mainly decided by the food prices. So we had we see the down down cycle downward cycle of pork prices last year. So that's dragged down the CPI inflation. 
And this year, because of the pork prices normalized and also with a low base effect, we think the PPI will like climb to 2% mildly. And for the uh, commodity side, I think impact is very limited because it's uh, mainly reflective for the utility prices. Uh, utility prices in China, actually it's uh, the price is uh, largely fixed. So I think the, uh, so it's, uh, it's hard to like uh, pass that one to the utility. And also for some uh, the gasoline prices, I think that there's uh, some hikes, but it's also largely uh, limited. And then for the, for the product side, for example, for the non-food part, uh, I think the, the CPI is also very mild. The reason is because of the competitive market. So for the producers rather squeeze their profit margin and but uh, rather to like increase in the price of the consumer side uh, for competitiveness to uh, to uh, to actually for their market share. That's not all. That that's actually uh, that's not like how uh, I think it's quite common in Asia. We also see similar situation in Japan. So I think the PPI inflation is very hard to transfer to the CPI inflation. So that means actually for the mid midstream and the downstream. Uh, for the entrepreneurs, like uh, we're facing a lot of pressure if we have the, this kind of the commodity prices keeps high. What about the uh, the effect on current account surplus? Just that should be a dollar calculation. Do we know? Uh, what, you know, so obviously yeah. going to be a reduction in the current account surplus because you're going to be paying more for your energy in dollars. Uh, uh, yes, I think. The, uh, I think the, for that part, last year, as you might know, we actually had a record high trade surplus and the current account, account surplus. So I think that that's two parts, import, price, import side, definitely, I think because of the rising of the, uh, the commodity prices, especially the oil, that will put some uh, uh, increase in the bill on the import side. But on the other side, the, for the China's exports, it's also very strong. I think the uh, I think the especially during the pandemic, I think it shows strong resilience on the export side. So we think that that could uh, uh, narrowing down the trade surplus, but we still expect the trade surplus and the current uh, account surplus like uh, this year as well. It's high at highest in value terms, not as a percentage of GDP. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the highest in the value terms, and, and yes. also. Yeah, and also like I think that for the China side and also uh, China have the three batches of oil reserves. So of course, I don't think that China will use the oil reserve at this stage, but I think that China actually in the past, uh, uh, the two to three years, and it's uh, already like a complete the second batch of the oil reserves. I think that for the third batch is also almost done. I think that they are, they are like a starting from like a more like all uh, the new batches of oil reserves. I think that now, before I think the China's target is at least like a 90 days, similar to the US, like at the target, but now with a demand, like a daily demand increase. So we reached the value target, but as a percentage, I think that it's still like a, only like a, about like a 30 days of the like a reserve. So China will continue for that oil reserve, but definitely not at this moment. But in the past several years, I think that that's uh, yeah. how China work, yeah. Yiping, anything you want to add on that? No. The, uh, what about the uh, ruble devaluation? I mean, I guess China's trade with Russia, it's predominantly agriculture and energy. So 50% uh, devaluation, which has occurred, I guess won't have much of an impact. I, I don't know, but what, certainly some of the machine, I saw an article, a machinery exporter to medical machinery exporter to Russia said, you know, this devaluation, they're not going to buy it. They can't afford our products anymore. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't remember the detailed numbers, but uh, um, China is probably one of the largest trading partners for Russia. But uh, um, the other way around, it's not a very significant uh, part of the market. So I think uh, the, the, the real impact, as I said, is number one, the overall risk premium. And the other thing is, specifically on some um, energy and agricultural product market that probably can play significant roles. 
But wow. these are more about the wheat importing from uh, um, from uh, the uh, from Russia. Yes, I saw that China authorized wheat imports from Russia. Right, right. Uh, and they formally got that wheat from Ukraine, but Ukraine is going to have a tough time exporting wheat in the current environment. Um, true, true. You know, yeah, uh, for the... Mm -hmm. For the oil side, I think the uh, actually China and Russia uh, for the oil, like uh, China imports oil from Russia, it's mainly like uh, it's in uh, in Chinese yuan, so it's not actually denominated in the dollar, and uh, yuan plus some uh, uh, the uh, yuan plus gold, so that's actually pushed the like uh, for the for the in the foreign reserve structure for Russia, one third is good gold. Actually, it's uh, mainly like uh, it's, uh, for the commodity treaties with China. So the rest is uh, for the CNY because uh, you, uh, for Russia also purchase uh, lots of like uh, products from China. The uh, are tariffs are the U.S. tariffs still affecting economic growth in China? And if they were removed. Do we have any analysis as to what effect that would have on China's economy, or it's kind of been factored in and it's kind of not much of an effect anymore? Yvan, you have a view? Yeah, for this part, uh, let's say like uh, starting from 2018, uh, for China and the US actually the, for the tariffs, uh, like uh, now it's on average it's 8%, uh, comparing with uh, the China China's tariffs with the rest of the world actually declined significantly. Uh, so for China side, I think the, um, the impact is, uh, I should say, have some impact, especially for the individual exporters. But overall speaking, I think the impact is uh, limited. Uh, I think the first, I think the, during, in the past two years, especially during the pandemic, I think that because of the resilience of the China's uh, supply chain, I think the, the China's production actually uh, continued even during the like a pandemic. So that's like uh, last year we registered like a 30% of the growth in exports. So the China actually uh, had a record high for the trade surplus and also have a record high trade surplus with the US side, although it's not good. <laughs> but uh, I think it's uh, because of the resilience of the trade supply. And also, uh, second, I think the now, um, I'm not quite sure, the, for the China is willing to purchase more from the US, uh, but I guess now for the negative list of the US side to China, I think it's getting longer. So I think it's uh, sometimes it's hard to purchase, like uh, especially given this uh, longer and the longer ne negative list. Uh, I think the one, one, one side and actually the China and the US can work together is for the natural gas. I think that the China actually is willing to build up the like uh, the infrastructure uh, the, to uh, import the uh, natural gas. I think uh, that's the China actually the talk with some uh, uh, Middle East uh, uh, for the for the mid uh, uh, states like with the U.S. But it's uh, delayed because of pandemic. So I think the uh, overall speaking from the U.S. side, I think the, uh, that's actually cause for the trade one deal probably. Uh, in the 2020 and the 2021, only uh, complete about like uh, 60%. I think mainly it's because of the uh, pandemic. I think the now I heard it's a trade two deals is uh, uh, negotiations in process. I think hopefully China requests for the lower tariffs and also like a more uh, opening categories for China to import. I think the for the U.S. side, yeah, I think the, it's a uh, uh, there's a still a lot of like uh, uh, room to discuss if the both sides have the willingness. So I think that and also for the China export more like with the lower tariffs, that's also could probably help alleviate the inflation pressure in the U.S. currently. So my thoughts, EP, and any thoughts? No, I don't have anything to add. You know, the analysis in the United States is that the ending of the Trump era tariffs would probably be about a 
it would be a one-time shock, a one-time reduction in inflation, and it's probably around 50 basis points, so a half a percent. Um, you know, it's not when your inflation is running at seven and a half percent. It's it's not uh, it's not that material. But my argument is it's actually it disproportionately affects lower income Americans. You know, the right. tariffs affect lower income Americans. And it's good. It, it would have a psychological effect. I mean, part of inflation is psychology, and it would have a, a, a positive psychological effect to seeing prices at Walmart or elsewhere reduced. Right. But, uh, I mean, I have, I, I'm a you, you. <laughs> Yeah. If you look at from the Chinese side, I mean, my, my, my two, two points is uh, number one, if you look at the, the actual trader numbers, um, the real impact has been quite limited. So um, on, on your side, you said, well, it probably was contributing to your higher inflation. And on the Chinese side, it was probably also cutting into exporters the profit margin. Um, that's one thing, but the, the actual flows are continuing. The second point, however, um, we also need to keep in mind is uh, the question of like how long this high tariff continues. Part of the reason why the trade pattern remains is because adjusting the trade pattern takes time. Um, you don't easily shifting around the supply chain and, and so on. If you maintain like a 30% tariffs for a very long time, I'm sure there will be a lot of a reallocation. So I, I certainly believe a reduction of the tariffs on the Chinese imports was hugely beneficial for the Chinese manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the suggestions I make to both governments. I have to, as I was Absolutely. partly Absolutely. joking, uh, I'm clearly a minority view uh, and I don't fully understand why. But let's talk about uh, the digital currency. Um, we've talked about it in programs before. It was used in the Olympics uh, recently. The central bank is saying that they have 261 million digital wallets, 13.9 billion of transactions. Um, where are we and where is it gonna be going? And does it play at all in the sanction regime? You know, will it be rolled out vis-a-vis -vis Russia so, they, so SWIFT could be avoided or, or other things? Um, well, at, at the moment, I don't have much information to update, and we all know this was used at the Winter Olympic Game uh, camps and so on. Uh, but we don't have a further updates as like how many people actually used inside that circle and uh, um, how effective the system was. Uh, what I know at this stage is this, um, this CBDC or what we call ECNY is still on trial. When they will roll out, and I think that this is still an uncertain question, obviously there are many issues still need to be resolved. The one particular issue is uh, um, you're going to have nine digital wallets um, and uh, issued by, uh, developed by different institutions, but you need a central bank, which is an overall arch architect of this system to be able to monitor um, and, 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 and mitigate the risk. Um, this is a pretty um, new thing. So um, I have no knowledge of uh, when it might be rolled out. And what I heard is it, we're still seeing experimentation and that experimentation might actually be um, ex extended um, to such, at some stage. The second part of your question is, well, can this be used to some, in some way um, to mitigate the, um, the, the financial sanctions? Um, out the, I doubt. Um, I doubt is number one, because ECNY is a retail um, CBDC, mainly for domestic. Really, you can't really go out unless it becomes an international currency, but we know Chinese Yuan is not an international currency and it's retail for retail purposes um, in terms of for, 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 for come by avoid the consequences of, um, the, um, of the sanctions. 
what you really need is a retail, is a wholesale um, CBDC and an internationalized currency. That I think is not, not, not happening. This is the first point. The second point, which I don't know, and I think there is a risk, even if um, ECNY can be used to mitigate that risk um, that imposed by um, the sanctions. I think there is a question to the Chinese authorities and the Chinese financial institutions if you want to do it, because we hear um, the American officials saying if um, foreign institutions and the governments help to ease um, the pain on Russia um, be, uh, uh, be, uh, using other tools um, in order to, to ease the pain of the sanctions, there might be consequences. And I think we need to look at that very uh, closely. So technically, it's very difficult, but also policy wise, I'm not sure um, this is something that uh, we should do or we, we're able to do. Interesting. Um, CPTPP and the Digital Economy Partnership, China has applied uh, for membership in both. Um, where does that stand and kind of how is the government thinking about these really very uh, high quality agreements, very high quality international agreements, uh, where I think it's fair to say that as they're currently written, China would have to make a lot of changes to comply. Not sure if Ifa has any insight. Um, I don't have any updates, uh, latest update on what is happening. Um, two things I think uh, um, happening at the moment. One is the government is um, regulating the digital economy at the moment. They're rolling out lots of uh, um, new regulations and laws and so on. So to some extent, like protection of data privacy, I think it's probably, or the law itself is probably already international standard, not implementation will lag, but I think that is gradually getting closer to uh, the international standard. One major barrier, my own view, um, if there is a barrier um, in terms of the digital economy data in uh, um, joining whether CPTPP or DIPA um, you mentioned, is uh, um, whether or not we can allow free flow of data cross border. Um, that's something I don't know because um, mm -hmm. for the authorities, there is a question of free flow of data and the security or safety um, of the economy, even, even political security. Um, we don't know how do we uh, uh, find a, a compromise um, in uh, between um, these, uh, these two. So it's, it's a bit difficult uh, um, at the moment. The second thing is, I also think, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the, the Russian-Ukraine um, conflict or a war probably will also raise uh, questions about the potential risks going forward. So, so I think these are the very important issues that will need to uh, be taken into uh, consideration when we look at the, um, the, 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 the new initiatives. Um, but overall, I think that the government remains determined in uh, continue to open um, and joining the international uh, rules. And the, the authority is talking about also participating and joining in setting the rules for our global digital trade and so on. But uh, we will need to find a balance um, between these very, very tricky issues. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, I first add some of the information for the um, uh, for the e, uh, CBDC. So currently, we have the trials in the ten plus one cities in China. So it's uh, when it started in April twenty twenty. So that started in four cities: Suzhou, Xiongan, Chengdu, and Shenzhen, and then now extended to like uh, ten cities. Uh, we started with uh, 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 six wallets, and now we have the, uh, we start with the four wallets, now have the six wallets plus some like a third party. So we have the more wallets to, to include it. And currently like over 140 million individuals and 10 million companies open the ECNY wallet. That's, uh, that's the data by the end of the 2021. So covering transport, healthcare, shopping, catering, and tourists, et cetera. So the total transaction is already over 60 billion. 
So, and also for that one, it also started like uh, experimenting like 11 experiment areas, especially like uh, uh, with uh, some of the third parties, especially with, uh, uh, for example, like uh, Tenshin, Ali, Jindong, Didi, and uh, expanded application scenarios. Uh, so it's uh, both online and offline. So, but mainly of for this ECNY actually is given for free. So that's actually to attract the uh, individual to try. Uh, and also, I think the one thing it's also coordinate with the banks. And also one thing is quite interesting. It's a, you don't have to, um, because like uh, for, uh, for the, Tech wise, and it's uh, you don't have to uh, have that the, uh, the the machine to to do it. I think sometimes it's uh, just like uh, for the distance, like uh, you can also like have the transactions. I think the, uh, besides Olympic uh, Winter Olympics, so it's a try like international try. I think besides that, we have some cross board tries. Uh, we say uh, we saw some several central banks. It's also coordinated with uh, uh, the Chinese government, like a PBOC jointly with the Hong Kong IMA, Bank of Thailand, and the UAE exploring using distributed ledger technology for real time foreign currency transactions between countries. So and also uh, for the cross border try could also start the in Shenzhen. That's uh, actually it's uh, mentioned by the, uh, the Chinese government. And I think the, uh, because of the pandemic, it's delayed, but we think it will actually, it's a uh, combined with uh, uh, Hong Kong could do. So now the China, I think they also have that the system, but we, we don't think it's uh, uh, the replacement of the SWIFT. I think the SWIFT is dominant, but uh, definitely there's uh, something new to try. So the China is the first to try. And uh, I think the one issues it's uh, uh, like uh, how to for the technology like uh, whether it's a uh, well received especially cross border because now in China it seems that actually it's a uh, function well uh, whether it uh, can be received and also with all this kind of data sensitivity as uh, EP mentioned that could be one issue. And I think that for the second is uh, for the overseas like uh, for the CN1 market. We don't have an outstanding CL1 market, like an offshore market yet. I think for the Hong Kong offshore market, I think it's, uh, uh, it's not that active. So currently the trading uh, wise, I think the London is the most active one, but still because of the China's uh, trading surprise, I think the, for the CNY offshore market overseas is still very limited. So I think uh, that's also some ways like a uh, continue to work on. Uh, but so I think uh, for the CL, uh, for the PPOC side, it's already accumulated a lot of uh, experience like uh, in for the CDBC. And I think that's uh, actually, it's also in line with the digitization of the economy. So I think the, uh, for the China side, the government also puts a lot of efforts like uh, pushing for the digitization. I think not only like uh, for the, I think there's uh, for the order for the different consumer scenarios and also for the, even for the business like uh, transactions. I think the, the China is still, I think they're one of the leading countries in, uh, uh, in this field, that's it. Great. Talk about the, the zero, the economic effects of the zero tolerance for COVID. How many lockdowns are there? I mean, I read about lockdowns in different cities all the time. How many are there in China now? What sectors are most uh, severely impacted by these lockdowns? And is there any analysis of what the effect is on China's economy overall? And um, when okay. Yiping kind of suggested it may ease up in the second half of this year, which hopefully will include lower or no quarantines for Americans going to, like me, going to China. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Yi Ping. I think currently the China have uh, still have a uh, 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 multiple mini lockdowns. So I think that's a little bit different. Mini lockdowns for dynamic zero policy. So that means like, uh, especially after the post uh, winter Olympics, I think the N NDRC uh, jointly with uh, 14 minist minist uh, ministers have uh, like a jointly announcement and uh, to avoid the escalation of the lockdowns. So I think that now with uh, like uh, the, and also we expect for the domestic mobility will largely increase after the 
like uh, the Olympics. So I think the currently also the China will probably still uh, stay with that the zero uh, COVID zero policy, but with a lot of uh, with uh, with a much more flexibility. Uh, so currently, I think it's uh, many lockdowns means like uh, for the uh, for the small district to lock down, but the people with an active inside still have the mobility in within the restrict. And also, I think the because of the Omicron normally lasts uh, uh, lasts a shorter period comparing with the Delta. So I think that also the lockdown period could be uh, shortened. Uh, I think the, uh, I agree with Yi Ping. I think that for the second half. Uh, probably the China will gradually reopen in the board for the vaccinated foreigners. So I think, <laughs> but it's not like, but still we'll have the quarantine, but currently it's 21 days, could be shortened to like 14 days or even seven days, <laughs> hopefully. And I think that hopefully there are some more flights and uh, I, I still think like um, if the if needs like open, I think the Hong Kong could be the uh, the first one to open. Although the Hong Kong now situation is quite serious, uh, hopefully the Hong Kong could. I think it's not picked yet, uh, but I think that it could be largely controlled maybe by April, and uh, hopefully by then I think the uh, the the, the opening border will may might start with Hong Kong and more expanded to the like uh, the rest of the world. Yeah, I saw an analysis by one of your competitors, Yifan, which had it peaking the third week of March and basically petering out by the end of April, which is oh, yes, yes. I think that yeah, it, it's. Okay. Uh, <laughs> It's like, uh, yeah, and now the situation, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's quite serious. And I think in Hong Kong, because of the limited uh, uh, medical resources and also have some, um, um, I think the organization uh, problem, I think that for this kind of, it's uh, not like a very organized, like uh, for the, like uh, the overall, like the management, I think the death rate is uh, pretty high. So that's an issue, especially not only for the deaths, like uh, for the elderly people, I think they also have some uh, death rate for the like uh, for the young kids, like uh, maybe below ten without vaccination. So I think that will become an issue. Now the death rate actually, if we uh, calculate the percentage, probably now it's the highest, highest like uh, one of the highest among yeah in the world. So hopefully, you have an estimate of what it would what this is going to do to Hong Kong's GDP for two thousand twenty two. I think. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I think to definitely it will have a hit on, on, on Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, I think the similar to China, I think the services uh, sector actually is the hit most. Uh, I think the for example in China for the uh, for the services sector, uh, by twenty twenty we saw by the end of twenty twenty it's uh, only like a sixty or seventy percent of the level of the two ninety. In the twenty twenty one because of the resurgence of the COVID, we actually still. Uh, by the end, it's only 70 or 80 percent, including this kind of travel, entertainment, box office, restaurant. So it's a very similar to Hong Kong. So I think that it's uh, there's a no travel. It's largely controlled, and the dining is uh, controlled like after six uh, after six p.m. So I think that for Hong Kong, because it's a service, actually accounts for uh, seventy percent of the GDP. So that will actually it's, uh, hurt a lot. Uh, but one side for the financial service, I think that's relatively. Uh, uh, fine, we are now all working at home. I think the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is still open. I think that's thanks to probably digitization of the economy. So, but for the, yeah, for the, for the service, so for the similar to the US, for this kind of a more like a lower end service, actually it's uh, affected the most. We have a bunch of great audience questions, but by the way, many have been covered in the course of our conversation. So let me go to some that haven't. One from Kevin Archer, who asks, What's the impact that China's demographic deficit will have on future forecasts? What, what do you mean by demographic deficit? The aging, the aging, aging, work, aging workforce and basically flat, 
flat, no, no population growth now and probably uh, beginning to have a shrinking population. Well, obviously this will be a key factor affecting economic performance going forward. Um, our school, National School of Development and the Brookings Institution actually did a, a report um, called the China 2049. Um, English version was published by the Brookings um, uh, Press. If you're interested, you're welcome to, um, to take a look. And, and the demographic change was one of the key uh, issues. And that obviously will have a negative impact on economic uh, activities, uh, probably weakening demand, um, lowering saving um, and uh, declining labor supply and so on. But if labor supply is the key concern, uh, there is a possibility um, of uh, benefiting from this so-called the fourth industrial revolution, the AI, the robots, and so on. In fact, for that, that, that book, we invited one um, a scientist from uh, Baidu um, to join force with the labor economists and to did a report um, for us on that potential, uh, potential uh, consequence. And then what they found was um, over the next 30 years, we probably going to lose something around the 200 million uh, workforce. But if we can make the technology policy right, um, AI and the robots probably can substitute for more, a bit over than 200 million um, workforce over the next 30 years. If they're right, then this particular impact can actually be mitigated. So aging will be negative for um, the economy overall, although there will be some uh, silver lining um, in the activities as well. But uh, um, in the new digital age, the, um, the negative in impact has, has, does not have to be as devastating as before. Yeah. Yeah, Kai Fu Lee's book actually talks about that mm. you know, in terms of replacing workers, you know, with robots, oh. with autonomous vehicles, with all of these yeah. things, which as the workforce shrinks, this can make up for some of the... Well, if, Steve, if you watch the, um, the Olympic Games, um, the, the broadcast, you see a lot of already happening there. They're using robots um, uh, cooking the, the, the dishes and uh, serving the dishes for um, the athletes and so on. But in, even in our daily lives, we are seeing these like uh, very, very uh, common now. We're just about out of time. So are either of you, do you know, uh, Alice Meng at the Asia Society in Hong Kong asked, do you know the status of China's mRNA vaccine? Uh, will this vaccine potentially lead to China's modifying its zero COVID strategy? And then I had been told in June or July that the US, M, you know, either Moderna or Pfizer vaccines based on mRNA technology would be approved in China, but they, to my knowledge, they never were. So what, what happened? That you, either of you know about either of those? I have no knowledge. Hmm. I, I think the, uh, in, uh, in actually it's uh, for the uh, for the mRNA for that the uh, Binotech. I think the, for the Moderna's uh, now it's uh, recently uh, we heard uh, the government approved uh, in China. So, but the when it will start, I think the, it's uh, uh, it, it, it don't have the details yet. Uh, but we see it's already there's a, some of the like a green light it's already signal the green light. Uh, I think the, the 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 China side and also wants to uh, uh, like uh, manufacturing the mRNA in China. So I think that that's probably the negotiation between like a Chinese government and also the companies. So now we already see some uh, like uh, uh, the signal of the green light. Uh, so we expect actually to will start uh, soon. And also, I think I also see some of the media uh, articles is already uh, start with the, okay, if you have the two Sinovac dose, maybe the third one, you, the booster can use the mix like uh, as uh, like a Madonna. Yeah, like an MRA. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's coming. Yeah, it's yeah. coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're talking about that. I can't end 
without asking my favorite question, which you both know I ask every year, which is just in and you just because we're out of time, just one minute on potential one potential upside surprise, one potential downside surprise. What are people not thinking about in terms of the economy going forward? That's pretty tough um, uh, at, at the moment. Um, I actually don't know what would be the main um, upside. Um, for the short-term economic activities, I guess, because the property sector was so important for economic growth and that was shrinking last year so quickly, the policies start to ease. If we can start to see um, the property sector to be revitalized, then it could uh, support the growth quite strongly. Although I'm not sure if this is a, is a good thing in the long run. Um, that's something I think, uh, um, I don't know, but I think this, uh, this could potentially uh, be something to watch. The downside, I've always been watching the financial risks. The leverage ratio is already quite high. Um, and we are seeing the SMEs, for instance, the government is talking about giving them more liquidity, more loans and so on, but their cash flow problems continue to, to, to be constrained. And um, the pay peer, well, one thing I noticed that during the past two years, the payment period for the account receivable for these SMEs increased from 30 days before COVID, and now it's about 90 days. So a lot of money for the SMEs are actually being held by the large enterprises, their, their, their counterparties. Um, and, 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 and many business people, um, owners of small companies, spend lots of time trying to chase the money back and they cannot upset their counterparties because they, they depend on them for the business. This is becoming uh, quite a tricky at the moment. Yifan. Okay, so um, I think that in my view, the upside will be large cut in the tax and the fees. I think the, the China has the highest tax in the world, <clears throat> especially not only, uh, especially for the corporates. So if there's any uh, large cuts, I think definitely there will be, especially give the SMEs a lot of support and also give the like uh, for the uh, some of the sector the government uh, the, the for the China so matching for the long term growth and that will be actually is a, a really good things tax and fee cuts and for the downside um, I think I always uh, think of the Sino U S side uh, so currently with the sentiment in the U S and especially like uh, for the after the China bill China competition bill is passed by senator and we. We know it's a, like a well could be like a past like a, uh, become the law soon, and we don't know whether there's a, some additional pressure from the U.S. side. So especially for the pressure on the tech side, so that's something we 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 are concerned. You know, it's funny when I think of the upside, I always because everybody says I'm a minority. I say we cut tariffs, and it would have a nice effect on the U.S. economy, a nice effect on the Chinese economy, and it would be a surprise because nobody expects it. So that would be a surprise of the upside, of course. But this has been a fabulous session. I would I would sit here and talk with both of you till well into my early morning hours. You two are terrific. You're terrific for participating in this. For participating in our track to dialogue. I should tell the audience, when I have questions about the Chinese economy, this is who I turn to, but you've really been great. Thank you so much. And I see nobody, virtually no one from the audience has signed off. So it's been, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.